following is a reading of Aldo Leopold's The Land Ethic, which is an excerpt from his book, A Sand County Almanac. This is brought to you by Redworks, and I'm Adriana. When godlike Odysseus returned from the wars in Troy, he hanged all on one rope a dozen slave girls of his household whom he suspected of misbehavior during his absence. This hanging involved no question of propriety. The girls were property. The disposal of property was then, as now, a matter of expediency, not of right and wrong. Concepts of right and wrong were not lacking from Odysseus's Greeks. Witness the fidelity of his wife through the long years before at last his black prowed galleys clove the wine-dark seas for home. The ethical structure of that day covered wives, but had not yet been extended to human chattels. During the three thousand years which have since elapsed, ethical criteria have been extended to many fields of conduct, with corresponding shrinkages in those judged by expediency only. The Ethical Sequence this extension of ethics, so far studied only by philosophers, is actually a process in ecological evolution. Its sequences may be described in ecological as well as in philosophical terms. An ethic, ecologically, is a limitation on freedom of action in the struggle for existence. An ethic, philosophically, is a differentiation of social from antisocial conduct. These are two definitions of one thing. The thing has its origin in the tendency of interdependent individuals or groups to evolve modes of cooperation. The ecologist calls these symbioses. Politics and economics are advanced symbioses in which the original free-for-all competition has been replaced, in part, by cooperative mechanisms with an ethical content. The complexity of cooperative mechanisms has increased with population density and with the efficiency of tools. It was simpler, for example, to define the antisocial uses of sticks and stones in the days of mastodons than of bullets and billboards in the age of motors. The first ethics dealt with the relation between individuals. The Mosaic Decalogue is an example. Later accretions dealt with the relation between the individual and society. The Golden Rule tries to integrate the individual to society, democracy to integrate social organization to the individual. There is as yet no ethical dealing with man's relation to land and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. Land, like Odysseus's slave girls, is still property. The land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges but not obligations. The extension of ethics to this third element in human environment is, if I read the evidence correctly, an evolutionary possibility and an ecological necessity. It is the third step in a sequence. The first two have already been taken. Individual thinkers since the days of Ezekiel and Isaiah have asserted that the despolation of land is not only inexpedient but wrong. Society, however, has not yet affirmed their belief. I regard the present conservation movement as the embryo of such an affirmation. An ethic may be regarded as a mode of guidance for meeting ecological situations so new or intricate or involving such deferred reactions that the path of social expediency is not discernible to the average individual. Animal instincts are modes of guidance for the individual in meeting such situations. Ethics are possibly a kind of community instinct in the making. A community concept. All ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. His instincts prompt him to compete for his place in that community, but his ethics prompt him also to cooperate, perhaps in order that there may be a place to compete for. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. This sounds simple. Do we not already sing our love for and obligation to the land of the free and the home of the brave? Yes, but just what and whom do we love? Certainly not the soil, which we are sending helter-skelter down the river. Certainly not the waters, which we assume have no function except for turn turning turbines, loading barges, and carrying off sewage. Certainly not the plants, of which we exterminate whole communities without batting an eye. Certainly not the animals, of which we have already extirpated many of the largest and most beautiful species. The land ethic, of course, cannot prevent the alteration, management, and use of these resources, but it does affirm their right to continued existence and, at least in spots, their continued existence in a natural state. In short, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. In human history, we have learned, I hope, that the conqueror role is eventually self-defeating. Why? Because it is implicit in such a role that the conqueror knows, ex cathedra. Just what makes the community clock tick, and just what and who is valuable, and what and who is worthless in community life. It always turns out that he knows neither, and this is why his conquests eventually defeat themselves. 
In the biotic community, a parallel situation exists. Abraham knew exactly what the land was for. It was to drip milk and honey into Abraham's mouth. At the present moment, the assurance with which we regard this assumption is inverse to the degree of our education. The ordinary citizen today assumes that science knows what makes the community clock tick. The scientist is equally sure that he does not. He knows that the biotic mechanism is so complex that its workings may never be fully understood. That man is, in fact, only a member of a biotic team that is shown by an ecological interpretation of history. Many historical events hitherto explained solely in terms of human enterprise were actually biotic interactions between people and land. The characteristics of the land determine the facts quite as potently as the characteristics of the man who lived on it. Consider, for example, the settlement of the Mississippi Valley. In the years following the revolution, the three groups were contending for its control. The indigenous populations, French and English traders, and the American settlers. Historians wonder what would have happened if the English at Detroit had thrown a little more weight into the indigenous people's side of those tipsy scales which decided the outcome of the colonial migration into the cane lands of Kentucky. It is time now to ponder the fact that the cane lands when subjected to the particular mixture forces represented by the cow, plow, fire, and axe of the pioneer became bluegrass. What if the plant succession inherent in this dark and bloody ground had, under the impact of these forces, given us some worthless sedge, shrub, or weed? Would Boone and Kenton have held out? Would there have been any overflow into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri? Any Louisiana Purchase, any transcontinental union of new states, any civil war? Kentucky was one sentence in the drama of history. We are commonly told what the human actors in the drama tried to do, but we are seldom told that their successes or the lack of it hung in large degree on the reaction of particular soils to the impact of the particular forces exerted by their occupancy. In the case of Kentucky, we do not even know where the bluegrass came from, whether it was a native st species or a stowaway from Europe. Contrast the cane lands with what hindsight tells us about the southwest, where the pioneers were equally brave, resourceful, and preserving. The impact of occupancy here brought no bluegrass or other plant fitted to withstand the bumps and buffetings of hard use. This region, when grazed by livestock, reverted through a series of more and more worthless grasses, shrubs, and weeds to a condition of unstable equilibrium. Each recession of plant types bred erosion, each increment to erosion bred a further recession of plant types. This result today is a progressive and mutual deterioration, not only of plants and soil, but of the animal community subsisting thereon. The early settlers did not expect this. On the Cienegas of New Mexico, some even cut ditches to hasten it. So subtle has been its progress that few residents of the region are aware of it. It is quite invisible to the tourists who find this wrecked landscape colorful and charming, as indeed it is, but it bears scant resemblance to what was in 1848. This same landscape was developed once before, but with quite different results. The Pueblo tribes settled the southwest in pre-Columbian times, but they happened not to be equipped with range livestock. Their civilization expired, but not because their land expired. In India, regions devoid of any sod-forming grass have been settled, apparently without wrecking the land, by the simple expedient of carrying the grass to the cows rather than vice versa. So was this a result of some deep wisdom or good luck? We do not know as of yet. In short, the plant succession steered the course of history. The pioneer simply demonstrated, for good or ill, what successions in inhered in the land. Is history taught in this spirit? It will be once the concept of land as a community really penetrates our intellectual life. The ecological conscience. Conservation is a state of harmony between man and land. Despite nearly a century of propaganda, conservation still proceeds at a snail's pace. Progress still consists largely of letterhead pieties and convention oratory. On the back 40, we still slip two steps backward for each forward stride. The usual answer to this dilemma is more conservation education. No one will debate this, but it is certain that only the volume of education needs stepping up is something lacking in the content as well. It is difficult to give a fair summary of its content in brief form, but, as I understand it, the content is substantially this. Obey the law, vote right, join some organizations, and practice what conservation is profitable on your land. The government will do the rest. Is not this formula too easy to accomplish anything worthwhile? It defines no right or wrong, assigns no obligation, calls for no sacrifice, implies no change in the current philosophy of values. In respect of land use, it urges only enlightened self-interest. Just how far will such education take us? The example will perhaps yield a partial answer. By 1930, it had become clear to all except the ecologically blind that southwestern Wisconsin's topsoil was slipping seaward. 
1933, the farmers were told that if they would adopt certain remedial practices for five years, the problem would don the public would donate CCC labor to install them, plus the necessary machinery and materials. The offer was widely accepted, but the practices were widely, widely forgotten when the five-year contract period was up. The farmers continued only those practices that yielded an immediate and visible economic gain for themselves. This led to the idea that maybe farmers would learn more quickly if they themselves wrote the rules. Accordingly, the Wisconsin legislation in 1937 passed the Soil Conservation District Law. This said to farmers, in effect, we, the public, will furnish you free technical service and loan you specialized machines if you will write your own rules for land use. Each county may write its own rules and these will have the force of law. Nearly all the counties promptly organized to accept the, the offer but after a decade of operation, no county has yet written a single rule. There has been visible progress in such practices as strip cropping, pasture renovation, and soil lining, but none in fencing woodlots against grazing and none in excluding plow and cow from steep slopes. The farmers, in short, have selected those remedial practices which were profitable anyhow and ignore those which would, were profitable to the community, but not clearly profitable to themselves. When one asks why no rules have been written, one is told that the community is not yet ready to support them. Education must precede rules. If the education actually in progress makes no mention of obligations to land over and above those dictated by self-interest. The net result is that we have more education but less soil, fewer healthy woods, and as many floods as in 1937. The puzzling aspect of such situations is that the existence of obligations over and above self-interest is taken for granted in such rural community enterprises as the betterment of roads, schools, churches, and baseball teams. Their existence is not taken for granted, nor as yet seriously discussed, in bettering the behavior of the water that falls in the land, or in the preserving of the beauty or diversity of the farm landscape. Land use ethics are still governed wholly by economic self-interest, just as the social ethics were a century ago. To sum up, we asked the farmers to do what, what he conveniently could do to save his soil, and he has done just that, and only that. The farmer who clears the woods off a 75% slope turns his cows into the clearing and dumps its rainfall, rocks, and soil into the community creek. Is still, if otherwise decent, a respected member of society. If he puts lime on his fields and plants his crops on contour, he is entitled to all the privileges and emoluments of, the, of his soil conservation district. The district is a beautiful piece of social machinery, but it is coughing along on two cylinders because we have been too timid and too anxious for quick success to tell the farmers the true magnitude of his obligations. Obligations have no meaning without conscience, and the problem we face is the extension of the social conscience from people to land. No important change in ethics was ever accomplished without an internal change in our intellectual emphasis, loyalties, affections, and convictions. The proof that conservation has not yet touched these foundations of conduct lies in the fact that philosophy and religion have not yet heard of it. In our attempt to make conservation easy, we have made it trivial. Substitutes for a land ethic. When the logic of history hungers for bread and we hand out a stone, we are at pains to explain how much the stone resembles bread, and now describe some of the stones which serve in lieu of a land ethic. One basic weakness in a conservation system based wholly on economic motives is that most members of the land community have no economic value. Wildflowers and songbirds are examples. Of the 22,000 higher plants and animals native to Wisconsin, it is doubtful whether more than 5% can be sold, fed, eaten, or otherwise put to economic use. Yet these creatures are members of the biotic community and, if as I believe, its stability depends on its integrity, they are entitled to continuance. When one of these non-economic categories is threatened, and if we happen to love it, we invent subterfuges to give it its economic importance. At the beginning of the century, songbirds were supposed to be disappearing. Ornithologists jumped to the rescue with some distinctly shaky evidence to the effect that insects would eat us up if birds failed to control them. The evidence had to be economic in order to be valid. It is painful to read these circumlocutions today. We have no land ethic yet, but we have at least drawn near the point of admitting that birds should continue as a matter of biotic right, regardless of the presence or absence of economic advantage to us. A parallel situation exists in respect of predatory mammals, raptoral birds, and fish-eating birds. Time was when biologists somewhat overworked the evidence that these creatures preserve the health of game by killing weaklings, or that they control rodents for the farmer, or that they prey only on worthless species. Here again, the evidence had to be economic in order to be valid. 
It is only in recent years that we hear the more honest argument that predators are members of the community, that no special interest has the right to exterminate them for the sake of a benefit, real or fancy, to itself. Unfortunately, this enlightened view is still in the talk stage. In the field, the extermination of predators goes merrily on. Witness the impending erasure of the timber wolf by fiat of Congress, the conservation bureaus, and many state legislatures. Some species of trees have been read out of the party by economics minded foresters because they grow too slowly or have too low a sale value to pay as timber crops. These include white cedar, tamarack, cypress, beech, and hemlock are examples. In Europe, where forestry is ecologically more advanced, the non-commercial tree species are recognized as members of the native forest community who prefer to be preserved as such within reason. Moreover, some, like beech, have been found to have a valuable function in building up soil fertility. The interdependence of the forest and its constituent tree species, ground flora and fauna, is taken for granted. Lack of economic value is sometimes a character not only of species or groups, but of entire biotic communities. Marshes, bogs, dunes, and deserts are examples. Our formula in such cases is to relegate their conservation to government as refuges, monuments, or parks. The difficulty is that these communities are usually interspersed with more valuable private land. The government cannot possibly own or control such scattered parcels. The net effect is that we have relegated some of them to ultimate extinction over large areas. If the private owner were ecologically minded, he would be proud to be the custodian of a reasonable portion of such areas which would add diversity and beauty to his farm and to his community. In some instances, the assumed lack of profit in these waste areas has proved to be wrong, but only after most of them have been done away with. The present scramble to reflood muskrat marshes is a case in point. There is a clear tendency in American conservation to relegate to government all necessary jobs that private land owners fail to perform. Government ownership, operation, subsidy, or regulation is now widely prevalent in forestry, range management, soil and watershed management, park and wilderness conservation, fishery management, and migratory bird management, with more to come. Most of this growth in governmental conservation is proper and logical. Some of it is inevitable. That I imply no disapproval of it is implicit in the fact that I spent most of my life working for it. Nevertheless, the question arises, what is the ultimate magnitude of the enterprise? Will the tax base carry its eventual ramifications? At what point will government conservation, like the mastodon, become handicapped by its own dimensions? The answer, if there is any, seems to be a land ethic, or some other force which assigns more obligation to the private landowner. Industrial landowners and users, especially lumbermen and stockmen, are inclined to wail long and loudly about the extension of government ownership and regulation to land, but, with notable ex exceptions, they show little disposition to develop the only visible alternative, the voluntary practice of conservation on their own lands. When the private landowner is asked to perform some unprofitable act for the good of the community, he today assents only with outstretched palm. If the act costs him cash, this is fair and proper, but when it costs only forethought, open-mindedness, or time, the issue is at least debatable. The overwhelming growth of land use subs subsidies in recent years must be ascribed in large part to the government's own agencies for conservation education, the land bureaus, the agricultural colleges, and the extension services. As far as I can detect, no ethical obligation towards the land is taught in these institutions. To sum up, a system of conservation based solely on economic self-interest is hopelessly lopsided. It tends to ignore and thus eventually eliminate many elements in the land community that lack commercial value, but that are, as far as we know, essentially to its health, essential to its healthy functioning. It assumes, falsely, I think, that the economic parts of the biotic clock will function without the uneconomic parts. It tends to relegate to government many fun functions eventually too large, too complex, or too widely dispersed to be performed by government. An ethical obligation on the part of the private owner is the only visible remedy for these situations. The land pyramid. An ethic to su supplement and guide the economic relation to land presupposes the existence of some mental image of land as a biotic mechanism. We can be ethical only in relation to something we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. The image commonly employed in conservation education is the balance of nature. For reasons too lengthy to detail here, this figure of speech fails to describe accurately what little we know about the land mechanism. A much truer image is the one employed in ecology, the biotic pyramid. I shall first sketch, first sketch the pyramid as a symbol of land and later develop some of its implication in terms of land use. 
plants absorb energy from the sun, this energy flows through a circuit called the biota, which may be represented by a pyramid consisting of layers. The bottom layer is the soil. A plant layer rests on the soil, an insect layer on the plants, a bird and rodent layer on the insect, and so on up through various animal groups to the apex layer, which consists of the large carnivores. The species of a layer are alike not in where they came from or in what they look like, but rather in what they eat. Each successive layer depends on those below it for food and often for other services, and each in turn furnishes food and services to those above. Proceeding upward, each successive layer decreases in numerical abundance. Thus, for every carnivore there are hundreds of his prey, thousands of their prey, millions of insects, and uncountable plants. The pyramid form of the system reflects this numerical progression from apex to base. Man shares an intermediate layer with the bears, raccoons, and squirrels which eat both meat and vegetables. The lines of dependency for food and other services are called food chains. Thus, soil, oak, deer, and native is a chain that has now largely been converted to soil, corn, cow, farmer. Each species, including ourselves, is a link in many change, chains. The, ear, the deer eats a hundred plants other than oak, and the cow a hundred plants other than corn. Both, then, are links in a hundred chains. Pyramid is a tangle of chains so complex as to seem disorderly, yet the stability of the system proves it is to be a highly organized structure. Its functioning depends on the cooperation and competition of its diverse parts. In the beginning, the pyramid of life was low and squat, the food chain short and simple. Evolution has added layer after layer, link after link. Man is one of thousands of accretions to the height and complexity of the pyramid. Science has given us many doubts, but it has given us at least one certainty. The trend of evolution is to elaborate and diversify the biota. Land, then, is not merely soil. It is a fountain of energy flowing through a circuit of soils, plants, and animals. Food chains are the living channels which conduct energy upward, death and decay return into the soil. The circuit is not closed. Some energy is dissipated in decay, some is added by absorption from the air, some is stored in soils, peats, and long-lived forests. But it is a sustained circuit, like a slowly augmented revolving fund of life. There is always a net loss by downhill wash, but this is normally small and offset by the decay of rocks. It is deposited deposited in the ocean and, in the course of geologic time, raised to form new lands and new pyramids. The velocity and character of the upward flow of energy depend on the complex structure of the plant and animal community, much as the upward flow of sap in a tree depends on its complex cellular structure. Without this complexity, normal circulation would presumably not occur. Structure means the characteristic numbers as well as the characteristic kinds and functions of the component species. This interdependence between the complex structure of the land and its smooth functioning as an energy unit, unit is one of its basic attributes. When a change occurs in one part of the circuit, circuit many other parts must adjust, adjust themselves to it. Change does not necessarily obstruct or divert the flow of energy. Evolution is a long series of self-induced changes, the net result of which has been to elaborate the flow mechanism and to lengthen, lengthen the circuit. Evolutionary changes, however, are usually slow and local. Man's invention of tools has enabled him to make changes of unprecedented violence, rapidity, and scope. One change is in the composition of floras and faunas. The larger predators are lopped off the apex of the pyramid. Food chains for the first time in history become shorter rather than longer. Domesticated species from other lands are substituted for wild ones, and wild ones are moved to new habitats. In the worldwide pooling of faunas and floras, some species get out of bounds as pests and diseases, others are extinguished. Such effects are seldom intended or foreseen. They represent unpredicted and often untraceable readjustments in the structure. Agricultural science is largely a race between the emergence of new pests and the emergence of new techniques for their control. Another change touches the flow of energy through plants and animals and its return to the soil. Fertility is the ability of soil to receive, store, and release energy. Agriculture by, by overdrafts on the soil, or by too radical a substitution of domestic for native species in this superstructure, may derange the channels of flow or deplete storage. Soils depleted of their storage or of the organic matter which anchors it wash away faster than they form. This is erosion. Waters, like soil, are part of the energy circuit. Industry by Polluting waters or obstructing them with dams may exclude the plants and animals necessary to keep energy in circulation. Transportation brings out another basic change. 
Plants or animals grown in one region are now consumed and returned to the soil in another. Transportation ta taps the energy stored in rocks and in the air and uses it elsewhere. Thus, we fertilize the ground with nitrogen gleaned by the guano birds from the fishes of the, of the, of the seas on the other side of the equator. Thus, the formerly localized and self-contained circuits are pulled on a worldwide scale. The process of altering the pyramid for human occupation releases stored energy, and this often gives rise during the pioneering period to a deceptive exuberance of plant and animal life, both wild and tame. These releases of biotic capital tend to the cloud or postpone the penalties of violence. This thumbnail sketch of land as an energy circuit conveys three basic ideas. One, that the land is not nearly soil. Two, that the native plants and animals kept the energy circuit open, others may or may not. Three, that man-made changes are of a different order than evolutionary changes, and effects have more comprehensive than is, than is intended or foreseen. These ideas collectively raise two basic issues. Can the land adjust itself to the new order, and can the desired alterations be accomplished with less violence? Biota seem to differ in their capacity to sustain violent conversion. Western Europe, for example, carries a far different pyramid than Caesar found there. Some large animals are lost, swampy forests have become meadows or plowland, many new plants and animals are introduced, some of which escape as pests, the remaining natives are greatly changed in distribution and abundance, yet the soil, but the soil is still there and, with the help of imported nutrients, still fertile. The waters flow normally, the new structure seems to function and to persist. There is no visible stoppage or derangement of the circuit. Western Europe, then, has a resistant biota. Its inner processes are tough, elastic, resistant to strain. No matter how violent the alterations, the pyramid so far has developed some new modus vivendi which preserves its ability for man and for most of other, the other natives. Japan seems to present another instance of radical conversion without disorganization. Most other regions, and some yet barely touched by civilization, display various stages of disorganization, varying from initial symptoms to advanced wastage. In Asia Minor and North Africa, diagnosis is confused by climatic changes which may have been either the cause or the effect of advanced wastage. In the U.S., the degree of disorganization varies locally. It is worst in the southwest, the Ozarks, and parts of the south, and least in New England and the Northwest. Better land uses may still arrest it in the less advanced regions. In parts of Mexico, South America, South Africa, and Australia, a violent and accelerating wastage is, still, is in progress, but I cannot assess the prospects. This almost worldwide display of disorganization in the land seems to be similar to disease in an animal, except that it never culminates in complete disorganization or death. The land recovers, but at some reduced level of complexity, and with a reduced carrying capacity for people, plants, and animals. Many biotas currently regarded as lands of opportunity are in fact already subsisting on exploitive agriculture, i.e. they have already exceeded their sustained carrying capacity. Most of South America is overpopulated in this sense. In and regions we attempt to offset the process of wastage by reclamation, but it is only too evident that the prospective longevity of reclamation projects is often short. In our own West, the best of them may not last a century. The confined evidence of history and ecology seems to support one general deduction. The less violent the man-made changes, the greater the probability of successful readjustment in the pyramid. Violence, in turn, varies with human population density. Dense population requires a more violent conversion. In this respect, North America has a better chance for permanence than Europe if she can contrive to limit her density. This deduction runs counter to our current philosophy, which assumes that because a small increase in density enriched human life, that an indefinite increase will enrich it indefinitely. Ecology knows of no density relationship that holds for indefinitely wide limits. All gains from density are subject to a law of diminishing returns. Whatever may be the equation for man and land, it is improbable, improbable that we as yet know all its terms. Recent discoveries in mineral and vitamin nutrition reveal unsuspected dependencies in the up circuit. With incredibly minute quantities of certain sub substances determine the value of soils to plants, of plants to animals. What of the down circuit? What of the vanishing species, the preservation of which we now regard as an aesthetic luxury? They help build the soil in what unsuspected ways may they be essential to its maintenance. Professor Weaver proposes that we use prairie flowers to re Locate the wasting soils of the Dust Bowl. Who knows for what purposes cranes and condors, otters and grizzlies, 
may someday be used. Land health and the AB cleavage. A land ethic, then, reflects the existence of an ecological conscience, and this in turn reflects a conviction of individual responsibility for the health of the land. Health is the capacity of the land for self-renewal. Conservation is our effort to understand and preserve this capacity. Conservationists are notorious for their dissensions. Superficially, these seem to add up to mere confusion, but a more careful scrutiny reveals a single plane of cleavage common to many specialized fields. In each field, one group, A, regards the land as soil and its function as commodity production. Another group, B, regards the land as a biota and its functions as something broader. How much broader is admittedly in a state of doubt and confusion? In my own field, forestry, group A is quite content to grow trees like cabbages with cellulose as the basic forest commodity. It feels no inhibition against violence. Its ideology is agronomic. Group B, on the other hand, sees forestry as fundamentally different from agronomy because it employs natural species and manages a natural environment rather than creating an artificial one. Group B prefers natural reproduction on principle. It worries on biotic as well as economic grounds about the loss of species like chestnut and the threatened loss of the white pines. It worries about a whole series of secondary forest functions, wildlife, recreation, watersheds, wilderness areas. To my mind, Group B feels the strengths of an ecological conscience. In the wildlife field, a parallel cleavage exists. For Group A, the basic commodities are sport and meat. The yardstick of production are ciphers of take-in pheasants and trouts. Artificial propagation is acceptable as a permanent as well as temporary recourse if its unit cost permits. Group B, on the other hand, worries about a whole series of biotic side issues. What is the cost in predators of producing a game crop? Should we have further re recourse to exotics? How can management restore the shrinking species like prairie grouse already hopeless as shootable game? How can management restore the threatened rarities like trumpeter swan and whooping crane? Can management principles be extended to wildflowers? Here again, it is clear to me that we have the same A-B cleavage as in forestry. In the larger field of agriculture, I am less competent to speak, but there seem to be somewhat parallel cleavages. Scientific agriculture was actively uh, developing before ecology was born, hence a slower penetration of ecological concepts might be expected. Moreover, the farmer, by the very nature of his techniques, must commodify the biota more radically than the forester or the wildlife manager. Nevertheless, there are many discontents in agriculture which seem to add up to a new vision of biotic farming. Perhaps the most important of these is the new evidence that poundage or tonnage is no measure of the food value of farm crops. The products of fertile soil may be qualitatively as well as quantitatively superior. We can bolster poundage from depleted soils by pouring on imported fertility, but we are not necessarily bolstering food value. The possible ultimate ramifications of this idea are so immense that I must leave their exposition to abler pens. The discontent that labels itself organic farming, while bearing some of the earmarks of a cult, is nevertheless biotic in its direction, particularly in its insistence on the importance of soil, flora, and fauna. The ecological fundamental fundamentals of agriculture are just as poorly known to the public as in other fields of land use. For example, few educated people realize that the marvelous advances in technique made during recent decades are improvements in the pump rather than the well. Acre for acre they have been barely sufficed to offset the sinking level of fertility. In all of these cleavages we see repeated the same basic paradoxes. Man the conqueror versus man the biotic citizen. Science the sharpener of his sword versus science the searchlight on his universe. Land the slave and servant versus land the collective organism. Robinson's injunction to Tristram may well be applied at this junction to Homo sapiens as species in geological time. Whether you will or not, you are a king, Tristram, for you are one of the time-tested few that leave the world. When they are gone, not the same place it was, mark what you leave. The Outlook. It is inconceivable to me that an ethical relation to land can exist without love, respect, and admiration for the land, and a high regard for its value. By value, of course, I mean something far broader than mere economic value. I mean value in the philosophical sense. Perhaps the most serious obstacle impeding the evolution of a land ethic is the fact that our educational and economic system is headed away from rather than toward an intense consciousness of land. Your true modern is separated from the land by many middlemen and by innumerable physical gadgets. He has no vital relation to it. To him, it is the space between cities on which crops grow. 
Turn him loose for a day on the land, and if the spot does not happen to be a golf links or a scenic area, he is bored stiff. If crops could be raised by hydroponics instead of farming, it would suit him very well. Synthetic substitutes for wood, leather, wool, and other natural land products suit him better than the originals. In short, land is something he has outgrown. Almost equally serious as an obstacle to a land ethic is the attitude of the farmer for whom the land is still an adversary, or a taskmaster that keeps him in slavery. Theoretically, the mechanization of farming ought to cut the farmer's chains, but whether it really does is debatable. One of the requisites for an ecological comprehension of land is an understanding of ecology, and this by no means coextensive with education. In fact, much higher education seems deliberately to avoid ecological concepts. An understanding of ecology does not necessarily originate in courses bearing ecological labels. It is quite as likely to be labeled geography, botany, agronomy, history, or economics. This is as it should be, but whatever the label, ecological training is scarce. The case for a land ethic would appear hopeless, but for the minority which is in obvious revolt against these modern trends. The key log which must be moved to release the evolutionary process for an ethic is simply this. Quit thinking about decent land use as solely an economic problem. Examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right, as well as what is economically expedient. The thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. It of course goes without saying that economic feasibility limits the tether of what can or cannot be done for land. It always has and it always will. The fallacy of the economic determinists have tied around our collective neck and which we now need to cast off is that the belief that economics determines all land use. This is simply not true. An innumerable host of actions and attitudes comprising perhaps the bulk of all land relations is determined by the land user's tastes and predilections rather than by his purse. The bulk, of, the bulk of all land relations hinges on investments of time, forethought, skill, and faith rather than on investments of cash. As a land user thinketh, so is he. I have purposely presented the land ethic as a product of social evolution because nothing so important as an ethic is ever written. Only the most superficial student of history supposes that Mo Moses wrote the Decalogue. It evolved in the minds of a thinking community and Moses wrote a tentative summary of it for a seminar. I say tentative because evolution never stops. The evolution of a land ethic is an intellectual as well as emotional process. Conservation is paved with good intentions which prove to be futile or even dangerous because they are devoid of critical understanding either of the land or of economic land use. I think it is a truism that as the ethical frontier advances from the individual to the community, its intellect con intellectual content increases. The mechanism of operation is the same for any ethic, social approbation for right actions, social disapproval for wrong actions. By and large, our present problem is one of attitudes and implements. We are remodeling the Alhambra with a steam shovel and we are proud of our yardage. We shall hardly relinquish the shovel, which after all has many good points. We are in need of a gentler and more objective criteria for its successful use. That was utterly opposed to the land ethic. It has quite a few ramifications today in terms of how we see the land as a community rather than as a commodity. And uh, yeah, it holds value in that sense. There are some areas where it might not be ideal, and it comes from a very Western perspective, so that it does uh, feel hindered by that. And it was written in the 1940s, but still, even for its time, it was quite ahead of how we think of things in terms of that Western perspective, as I mentioned. So, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it. This has been Breadworks, and I am Adriana.